Well, here we go. Hello, everybody. It is Chit Chat Live with Dima and Adrian tonight. Yes, we're so excited. We have Adrian, and we've been waiting for this. We've been waiting for a while. But before we get Adrian, how's it going, Rob? Hey, it's going good. I'm just here to listen. Tonight's going to be a good one. I know that Adrian's going to pop off crazy amounts, like stupendous amounts of nuggets of wisdom. I'm excited for that. <laughs> Apparently, there was a prep call. I am ready for y'all to take this show and run with it. I never heard of the word stupendous before, so I thought I thought I'm the one who makes up words. Oh, um, well, I can make up a few. Just give me some time. How are you doing, Dima? I'm doing good. I'm looking behind me, and apparently it's starting to get darker qu earlier. So do you realize usually it is, by now it's still nice outside. So right, right. I'm measuring, so we're, we're heading towards fall. Can you imagine? Fall is coming. Fall is coming. It'll be here before you know it. I'm ready for that weather to change. It's still crazy hot outside. Yes. You know, ready for 25% capacity football at some some way, shape, or form, you know. We have a lot of exciting things coming up. We got election, football, weather, COVID. <laughs> yeah, some of them are not exciting for me. I'm glad they're exciting for you. But I have right. one exciting thing that I know of is my friend Adrian. So let's get Adrian so we get to chit chat with her. Come on, Adrian, come on, come on. Adrian, Adrian, Adrian. <laughs> Got it. There you are. Oh, hey. <laughs> How are you doing? I know. I'm being funny with it tonight. This is going to be a good one. I have a fun vibe with it. I need it. What? You know, I get distracted. Dima starts doing? talking about weather and football, and it gets me. Um, Squirrel. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I told you. I, I warned you, Adrian. I, I did my part. <laughs> no, this is me. See, here's the thing. That's me at 8 a.m. Right, I'm a morning, I'm yeah. a morning squirrel. By nighttime, I'm more of like a, a koala bear, like <laughs> got some eucalyptus leaves ready for nap. You know? <laughs> so here's here's a fun fact about Adrienne that I learned recently. She is not just a coffee drinker; she's a coffee drinker. Oh, so Adrian, tell us Very tell us about how much coffee you drink with you. <laughs> <laughs> I drink a lot. Of be possible. <laughs> I mean, I start every day with like six cups and I drink that and then I make another six cups around like three. <laughs> Some days I go get like a lot. That's like 14 days. cups or something already. I drink a lot of coffee. So I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was young and my parents didn't believe in like medicine. <laughs> and they read like some hippie journal that said coffee would help kids with ADHD. I started drinking it when I was like nine. Nice. And it just makes me feel normal. I don't get like amped up. I'm just normal. You were that kid in the in the community coffee commercial, like with getting the grandmother with chicory getting put in. Yeah. Right. That was you, huh? Mm -hmm. That was literally me. I, so, do you have a taste for it, or is this something? I mean, do you enjoy it, or is it like have it now? Oh, like do I, what do you mean by have a taste? For, am I picky about it? Is that what you mean? Am I snobby? Are you bougie it? about your bougie? I get like drip coffee. I I do get like nice beans. They can, I my preference is Garden District coffee. They're in the hood. They're delicious. I like what they. I don't like burned, bad coffee, but I'm not. I use like a drip. I gotta. It's I'm I'm quantity over quality. I need. No, you you have a drip of coffee. That's what you. That's and really I, what you mean. Correct. Yeah. 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 Just intravenous <laughs> coffee. All day. Yeah. That's how you do it, right? You put you just it's just it just <laughs> you scoop it in. Yeah. That's how it works. That's how I drink so, coffee. Everyone that knows you loves you. I don't know yeah. anyone <laughs> that loves you. So Confirm. for anyone who doesn't know you, tell us about yourself. Uh I'll tell you about myself. So I, where, where should I start? I was born in Oklahoma. <laughs> I, uh, I have lived here for seven years in Baton Rouge. I love it here. 
I work for the LSU Foundation. I'm the AVP for Advancement Services. My title is not reflective of reality, I feel like. Um, I, I kind of run the operations at the foundation. I have two dogs and a husband. They're all cool. Um, I like eating. <laughs> I like reading books. I like playing games. I like being outdoors. What else do you want to know? Those are my. How do you fit all that in? How do I fit all that in? I have bound. I drink six cups of coffee in the morning and six more cups of coffee. Yeah, it all comes together. That yeah. makes sense. No. I do. I I'm like the Energizer Bunny, and I think the coffee helps. I don't know. It's not. I. I I'm. I am blessed by. Um, enjoy. I don't do things I don't enjoy. So I think that's the trick. So it's really easy to do a bunch of things when you like them. It's really hard to do a bunch of things when you hate them. True. Wow. True story. Profound, right, guys? <laughs> no. I and that's it. the show, y'all. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, it's been amazing. Uh, <laughs> we can wrap. <laughs> I've been looking forward to this. I'm a little weird tonight. I mean, this is this is this is fun. This is I'm a little silly tonight. This is fun. Good. Be silly. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> no. I'm, so wait. Uh, I'm curious. What you guys? What are two things that you guys hate to do that you have to do? Is this like work or in general? Like, yeah. like what first popped in your head of like I hate doing that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, all those things that I just thought of, I hate them, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Deepa, come on, come on. So I, I don't like managing my finances. That that was not boring. <laughs> and storing the information for the CPA, that kills me every year. <laughs> I get extension every single year. I just... I just like dread it. I just don't want to do it. So that is one. The second one, what is the other thing I don't like? I'll have Rob give us one until I think of second one. Okay. All right. I was using you as the step as the stall. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay. So I gotta go. Um, I mean, I don't like folding clothes. I don't mind washing the damn things. I just don't like folding That's them. Fascinating because folding is so zen. It's like only if I'm in the mood, like if, only if I know I'm getting shit done that afternoon and then I'm like, I'm in it. Right. Cause I committed. But if it's just, if it's just general clothes washing, absolutely not. I don't want to fold them. I'll wash them. That's Washing's amazing. fun. Just like dishes. I don't want to put them away. I'm actually okay with the crazy nasty mess mess. Now before I used to not want to get my hands dirty. Now I'm like totally fine. getting all in yeah. and having it like make its way to the dishwasher. But I don't like from the dishwasher to the cabinets or like the drawer next. To, I don't like that. That's that's like it's too more much. impact, right? Like you see more um, impact for your effort when you're actually scrubbing them, right? Like when you want to put them away, it's like I'm making all this effort and they're really just moving by feet. I like to I like to clean. I like to fix. I like to get it done and then move on. So I don't like the detail work. Like put this one little cup back here, mm -hmm. flip it upside down, and then that goes at the you know. So, okay. all right, Dima, did I give you enough time? Wait, knives up or knives down? I, go ahead. Knives up or knives down in the dishwasher? Knives oh. up or knife, uh, knives down? Because you don't want to, like, grab it. Mm. I agree. Oh. They are, they're knives down because the other day I tripped and I fell on the dishwasher when it was open. So if Ooh. I had a knife up. I would have had some bruises in my hey, mouth. Are you okay? <laughs> um, you I'm okay. A of a movie. <laughs> and I'm like, guys, that's you terrible. You fell the dishwasher? Right. If, yeah, because I I was jumping on the cabinet to get something from the top, and I fell. <laughs> oh, I'm the that was open. So if I had the knives up, I would not be having this conversation sitting down. <laughs> And thank God the last movie she watched wasn't Knives Out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, what, what was the other one with Zach Braff where the the like lady died on the open dishwasher? This is why I'm paranoid about open dishwashers. Oh, Had it man. Soundtrack. 
I'll, I'll think of it later. Is that a real phobia, Adrian? The open dishwasher phobia? It's a real phobia. My husband is snickering in the other room because he knows I'm super paranoid about open dishwashers. And Dima, you just proved my point. <laughs> it's like a bear trap for the kitchen, just sitting there on a bunch of tile, like a Murphy bed for you to fall into. Just, it's you know, not full cool. of knives. A Murphy bed full of knives. Yeah. Murphy bed full of knives, hopefully facing down. Okay, Dima. Do you anything else ahead. down? Like, does anything else face up? All my all my cutlery is down. But what, like, if you have so all the cutlery, spoons facing down. Cutlery is down. That's just good balance, to be quite honest. It's good everything's got because the spray comes up, so everything's kind of facing down, so it gets like the spray, right? Yeah, that's my, that's my philosophy. <laughs> Dima, where do you stand on dishwashers? You know where you fall on them. I don't, I don't like to un, un, uh, unload it. I, I don't like it. I'm okay to put stuff in it and put a press on start. I'm okay yeah. with that. <laughs> but and that's the problem because I'm I'm so lazy to uh, to unload it, and then I have all of this mess in the sink because I need to put them in the dishwasher. So, yeah, I have big problems with that. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. What about you, Adrian? You're getting us to talk. What, what about me? This is supposed to be a <laughs> long interview. <laughs> I'm going to die. Oh, come on back. Ask more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Have them talk. Have them talk. Yeah. yeah. That's my philosophy in life. <laughs> oh, this so is so much fun. Something you don't like to do. Something I don't like to do? Is that what you said? Your two Cat things. Hurt. I love my cat and I hate its litter. I'm never having another cat. I hate cat litter. It's You're nasty. Friend. I'm not a fan. If I could build a robot to deal with cat litter, I would have built it. There, yeah. there is one. It's not a real robot, but there are these litter boxes that clean themselves. So clean themselves. Clean themselves. But they they're still cleaning that must be done. I mean it's perfect. Have, it moves the poop over here. And it's like all <laughs> camera. It's moving like, robot, right? There's the poop, yeah. you know? <laughs> I need a robot that, like, scoops it, takes it away, <laughs> scrubs, sprays the room, <laughs> refills it, and, and beckons my cat back in. That's yes. what I mean. I need a robot for a lot of things. So that that would, I don't have a cat, but I wouldn't mind getting that robot just in case. <laughs> Dima, what kind of pet, what kind of pet person are you? She's no <laughs> um, okay, I was raised in the Middle East. Yeah. We tend to not have animals in our house. Right. <laughs> so uh, growing up, I, we used to have a cat outside that we would just give milk to. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't like uh, having pets in my home. But one time I was watching my sister's cat for, I think, I think four years. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that was very painful because the poor cat he really wanted attention and he thought that he was my husband he demanded attention <laughs> and when i travel when i travel for business i would get my neighbors to uh like to go home to my home and and feed him and change the little every, every single day but he would still be mad when i come home he would bite me and many times pray me so I'm not a fan. <laughs> uh, I get it. Okay, so back to Adrian. Adrian, um, one of the things that is fascinating about you is how you mix a lot of interesting things together. So gaming, tell us about gaming, how it started. And then of course, we're gonna dig deeper related to, to this topic. Yeah, um, so, I was actually just talking with a, a girlfriend of mine about this today. She was telling me about how she grew up with all girls and didn't grow up gaming. And she has a son now that she's been playing with. And she felt self-conscious that she didn't know very much about games. And she was kind of surprised to know that I actually started gaming pretty late in life. Um, my husband introduced me to World of Warcraft before he was my husband. We were just dating. And I quickly outpaced him. <laughs> um, I, I just... so. Let me back it up. It, you know, when I left college in 2008, it was economic recession. I got a job as in, well, first I was working in politics. That ended. And then I got a job as a nanny. 
And being a nanny was just not my forte. <laughs> I did not love it. And so like, you know, in my downtime or, or when the kids were sleeping, I would just play World of Warcraft. And then it would be when I was home at night, I would play World of Warcraft. And I just started playing all the time because I didn't have like a, a job that felt fulfilling to me. And I just started to progress and get better and better. And then I became, you know, one of, one of the top ranked players of my class in the world. And um, it was the kind of thing where it became almost like a full-time job. I mean, even though I, I later got a really fantastic job that I loved, I was still spending the majority of my free time playing World of Warcraft. Um, and the reason I talk about it so openly and freely is because I truly believe that World of Warcraft prepared me for business and leadership in life. Um, some of the most critical skills that I've been able to translate into my professional success are things that I learned through World of Warcraft in both like a very tactical way. So dashboarding um, is something that really elevated my career, helped me advance professionally. It was something I was able to bring an expertise in. And I learned it all video gaming and building my own user interfaces and things like that. Um, but also, you know, I led global teams of hundreds of people um, in a highly competitive environment. I was able to recruit talent on, on, on a globally competitive market. Uh, you know, I had to think really strategically how to solve very complex problems, synthesis of information. So uh, I read a study that said um, 15,000 new ideas are generated any one night in World of Warcraft. And when you're at a competitive level, you have to synthesize those 15,000 new ideas and, and, and articulate which of those are valuable and which do you need to absorb into your repertoire of play and which do you need to abandon. Um, the other thing about gaming is you have to be highly adaptable. So uh, think about if in basketball they could add a second basketball hoop one week and then add a, another basketball the next week. And then um, all of a sudden the court could be longer uh, two weeks later. Um, that's what it is to play video games. You know, every couple of weeks, they call them patch updates. They'll, they'll rebalance and retool. All of a sudden the rules change. A spell that was a key part of your rotation is thrown out the window. You have to adapt and adopt a new um, rotation in your gameplay. So that kind of just, you know, resilience, stick to um, learning, uh, knowledge acquisition. It was really critical to success in gaming and all of that is critical to success in the workplace. So I really, I like to talk about it because I want people to feel confident in their gaming experience and I want gamers to see that they have something to offer in, in, in reality, not just the virtual space. And I also want people um, in business to see that, you know, um, you can gain real world value and experiences in, in a virtual world. And I want people to pay attention to what their kids are doing and play with them and understand that there's a lot more to it than just like hanging out in your parents' basement, shooting people. I think that's what you know, most people think it is. So that's my gaming spiel. <laughs> so do you uh, ask me a question of asking me something about it? I mean, I mean, I can talk about it all day. I love it. I think it's amazing and super applicable because yeah, because of how you have to adapt and because, um, you know, I guess the stereotypes around that are what a gamer is totally consumed with games and nothing else. That's mm -hmm. not true. When we talked earlier, outdoors, reading, you know, you had plenty of interest. Um, so know. here's one of the things that I think people get wrong about gaming. And this is something that I really, I care about bringing into my, my role as a leader in organizations. The reason people spend more time in games than they do in real life sometimes is um, Jane McGonigal. She, she is a game designer and she is um, a researcher. And she wrote a book called Reality is Broken. And I think it's really apt because the premise that she makes is that virtual worlds incentivize meaningful work and they give you challenges that are on the verge of insurmountable, but you can overcome them. And they, and they give you those challenges um, in a collaborative environment with purpose. And how often in the real world are we given infinite collaborators, infinite purpose, and, and tasks that are on the verge of, 
of insurmountable, but but we know we can achieve them. You know, anybody in that environment would be so motivated to succeed, but the real world so rarely gives us that. And so that I think that's why people retreat to games. Um, well, you can also start over, right? There's checkpoints, there's milestones, <laughs> you can save game. Mm -hmm. Real life don't have that. I mean, you're on survival mode the entire time, so it doesn't quite work out that way. But yeah. it does give you an opportunity to try, test, retest, recalibrate, regroup. And like, that's all important knowing that you can start over again. Yeah. But but a lot of it means that we don't take that first step, right? I think that's right. So one of the things, like my team knows that there's Adrianisms and one of my Adrianisms is iteration is perfection. Um, and that's something I learned in gaming. And that's something you learn as like a software developer, right? Like you throw some code out, it, it throws an error, you figure out what was wrong, you iterate, you throw it back up, gives you an error, you iterate again. So, so people that are kind of used to a, 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 um, a technology, in, in an environment with technology or in a gaming environment are used to that iteration. I think traditional business settings are not as used to that. And, I, and you kind of have to be in a modern environment, right? Um, strategy has to be highly adaptable. I mean, if you weren't willing to iterate in COVID, you're going to fail. Um, and that's just a microcosm of, of, of the, the, the greater world. So I do think that gaming prepares you for that kind of comfort with iteration and that stick to to keep trying. Because I've seen so often, another book I love is called Good to Great. You guys have probably heard of it. Um, they call it keep um, the shoulder to the grindstone. So, so their shoulder to the flywheel. So, so the flywheel, you know, it takes a lot, lot of effort to get it moving right? But a flight wheel is something that moves on its own momentum once it gets going. And I have seen in, in many organizations and, and many of my roles, people start that grind, but they, they stop when the going gets hard and they don't let that flywheel get the momentum. Um, so for example, they'll start, a, a, let's say it's a diversity initiative and, and we're going to do it more all go all gung ho. And six months in, it's like, well, we don't have enough. It's not making enough progress. We're just going to scrap it. It's not important anymore. It's like, well, those things take time and it takes, it, you got to get momentum. You've got to keep your shoulder to the flywheel. And um, I think it's that kind of mentality. You develop it when you play video games uh, of knowing that you've got to keep trying. And I wish more people had it in a business space of, you know, we don't have to throw the whole thing out. Let's just iterate on it and improve it. Wow. I, it's just amazing how it was a coincidence. You started gaming for fun and now how you're used, like it's helping you be an absolutely amazing leader. And everything you said, um, I, I wish people hear this and apply it because this is what we're missing. We're missing more and more of good leaders. But going back to gaming, to me it is it's hilarious because the stereotype of the image of a gamer that would not match with with how you look so i would i would imagine a dude in the basement yeah. uh, you know, like yeah and eating chips as he is playing games <laughs> another one of the reasons that i love to talk about games though is because i believe that that women make the gaming space more productive and more collaborative and more successful ultimately the highest performing guilds i was ever in in, most in leadership and and the most toxic guilds i was ever in were all male. And, and I don't think that's a coincidence. And um, I think you can, I think you can like to curl your hair and wear gold jewelry and play video games, you know? Yes. Um, I started off as a working artist and, and my parents, you know, so I'm dyslexic. I mentioned earlier, I have ADHD. Math was not something I was naturally good at. I, I transpose numbers really badly. I have dysgraphia. So I write things incorrectly as well. Math is something you have to be have high precision in. And so that's another reason that like programming, I, I, I always wanted to be good at it, but I was bad at it because I, I, I was imprecise in, in scripts. Um, what gaming taught me is that you don't have to be that stereotypical left-brained IT guy to be successful. But what you need to have is creativity and grit um and um honestly 
for me, like a, a wild imagination was far more productive than somebody that was technically capable. Now having technically capable partners was really critical because I could throw out a crazy idea and I'd have somebody on in my guild or on my team that could say, okay, here's how we could do it. And that was so invigorating. Um, you know, I now find myself in technical leadership. Uh, you know, I, I became an analyst. I, I, I have a very, you know, most people think of me as like a left brain technical analytical person now but that's just a product of my journey through video games that really brought me there. That was not always the, the sphere that I lived in. That was not my background originally. And I wish more, I think that that's common of women, right? I think we get shoved into a box of literature and history. And, you know, I grew up watching Anne of Green Gables and reading Little Women and- um, Or being a nanny. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly accurate. That's what people were willing to hire me as. Um, because I had a, you know, a background in classical studies, you know, but, but I had so much more to offer and I was able to articulate that um, once I had a chance to get in the room. And, and, and that's the thing that gaming gave me was the opportunity to get in the room and say, look, here's some big ideas. Here's some ways that we could you know, analyze this data and apply these same principles uh, of um, performance evaluation and, and um, collaboration and all of that. So, well, once well, bringing uh, gaming brings you to the room, but once you're in the room, it's not usually a voice we're typically hearing on the other side of that headset or just in, 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 oh. in that, and in, in even in the non virtual world. I mean, for you to show up, have these ideas, be left, you know, not be left brain, mm -hmm. but succeed, Adrian. That's the story. That's the meat behind all this. Is how amazing your path is compared to most, and how the trajectory didn't quite, you know, it, it wasn't your typical, your typical path. I mean, that that's was so amazing and sexy about what you bring gaming to the professional world because those two worlds don't mix. They're like oil and water, and when you bring them together, they're like salt and pepper. Because when you realize that you don't have to look at it in those traditional ways, but you can unlock collaboration and communication and culture in a different realm or guild, yeah, it can be done, and it can be done across the globe. You were yeah. talking, you were okay, you were like top fifty or something. Mm -hmm. Top forty. Top fifty. But close I, enough. Yeah. What was it? What was it? Top forty. But yeah, top close 40. enough. Forty. That's it. Look. I think it was 30. Casey Kasem would say that is extremely important for that top 40. But look, no, it's true because it, there's a big difference going from top 1,000, top 500, 50, 40, 25, 10. That, that's a huge diff. That's a huge jump, like crazy barrier to entry, right? But even Getting top 1,000 was tremendous at the time because there were, I think, 13 million players in the world. Yeah. So that's where, um, but here's the thing. I, I truly believe that, and people don't want to hear this, but I was terrible. I could not even figure out how to right quick click to pick up a quest when I first started. And, <laughs> and three years later, I was downing some of the cutting edge bosses and, and only, uh, you know, and getting a server first. And the year after that, you know, um, uh, being one of the top ranked players. And so for like, it truly is just what you put into it. I just played a whole lot of World of Warcraft. You know, <laughs> well, just um, discount. They think you've got to be a virtuoso. And I'm, it was not me being a virtuoso. I played harder than my husband did. He was not as disciplined as me. He was a far better player. He truly was, but he was never going to reach the same levels that I did because he was just not as committed <laughs> to playing. Um, so, I, and it's the same way in real life. You know, I tell people like you get out what you put in. Young women come up to me all the time and say, I want to progress at the same level and same pace that you did. How did you do it? How do you balance it? I'm like, you've got to work really hard. I know that's not what people want to hear. Some people get no. the of being virtuosos. I would love to be that. Let's, let's, talk. Let's, let's talk about this, though, Adrian, because you're on to something. And this brings us to a topic that one of our users here, one of our viewers, you know, Miriam had, is mentioning here how she's watched Dima for such a long time. She's heard the TED Talks and how, how she's 
you know, she wants to know how times are, are overcome when they're hard. And so what keeps you going? You've mentioned stick to quite a few times. When you're looking for either someone on your team or characteristics of someone that makes a good guild member, you know, it, 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 does it does it encounter their journey in, in World of Warcraft being something like yours or how do they overcome it? What do you recommend for them? I would love to hear Dima answer the question of how she's overcome hard times first. I'm really interested in hearing that. Adrian does this to me every time. My question is <laughs> what do not qualify to meet the dashboard. That's why this is the Adrian and Dima show tonight. <laughs> I'll answer your question in a minute. I got a book. I want, I want to mention that a lot of the things you talked about apply. Of course, there's so so much yeah. other stuff, and it depends on the personality and depends on the circumstances as well. But you talked about continuing to, to work hard, continuing to try, um, how you worked harder than, than, your, uh, than your husband. Uh, that's, that's a big <laughs> part of it. And also when you were talking about the example from good to great with the, um, what did you call it, shoulder to... <laughs> I will. Yeah, things take time and we cannot be discouraged and disappointed real quick where we're trying something, escaping from a marriage and then thinking everything is not going to work. It's been 19 years and it's still a process. So, yeah. and to be patient with ourselves. It sounds like you are as well, to be patient and to keep learning. You mentioned like within three years, you were able to go from an absolute beginner to um to, to so much better like mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the title is but in my head it's more like a master mm -hmm. so uh, it is to give yourself time and to be patient and to be um to be kind to yourself throughout the process it's easy to judge ourselves isn't it but um mm -hmm. yeah. so these are little things but you mentioned them you as your ex like our experiences are so different our stories are very, very different, but everything you're saying is related to success, uh, mm -hmm. self-discovery, leadership, resilience, and that's why I love to hear you talk. So tell us more. Okay, so Dima, I'm curious. Do you, when when you were going through those things, you're talking about being kind to yourself and, and, and knowing that things take time. The reality is, is in the moment, I'm actually very hard on myself and I never stop to celebrate wins and I never feel successful. I've always got my eye on, on the future prize. And so I'm curious, do you, do you suffer some of that too? Or, or are you better at being kind to yourself in the moment? So here's what I did. Um, mm -hmm. So for whoever read uh, Breaking Bases, it wasn't just me escaping. My mom and sister had to escape to the U.S. too. So we, we all have to live together. And it was like the first three years were absolutely horrible, like beyond horrible and terrifying. But what we used to do anytime there was like a day, maybe not a day, maybe like a week or two where we were not threatened, we were not in a bad place, I would get a, a bottle of Prosecco and we would open it and we would celebrate. <laughs> so uh, so I can tell you, I drank a lot of Prosecco. Um, <laughs> Because I, I just needed to balance it out. Like if we're going to constantly be so terrified and uh, be, be in such a bad place, it's not going to have, like, it's not going to work. We need, we need something to motivate us to move forward. Uh, so that was part of our celebration. Not when something good happens, but if something not horrible happened, that's when we would celebrate. I like that. Something not horrible. And look at our lives. Like we're so blessed. I know. I know it's a tough year, and I know um, all of us were uh, we've been impacted by the pandemic. Uh, there's a lot of fear. There's fear of insecurity. But we're still so blessed. And instead of waiting for this big achievement to celebrate, just uh, celebrate that we're alive. Celebrate that we're still. We still have good things in our life. So some people call it gratitude. I I call it a reason to open a bottle of Prosecco. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's a good one. Yeah. So what about you? What, what do you do? What do I do um, for gratitude or, hmm, you know, I have this five minute journal <laughs> I, I, I like to do. Um, in the mornings, it asks you to name three things you're grateful for, 
three things that would make the day great. And, and then you give um, a daily affirmation. And then you end the day with three things that were amazing. And then two things of, or just an example of how you could have made the day better. And um, I'm not, I don't do it every day, but I try my darndest to do it um, most days. And, and it's, I think it's helpful to start uh, your, your day with some gratitude for me. Like even when it's hard, I I've shared this example before. I remember one day I was just, it was in the grind, you know, we were um, going through a layoff at the foundation and I was, um, you know, really trying to like figure out a budget, figure out how I could retain as many people as I could. The work was just felt insurmountable. COVID was just like ruining all my plans. I was supposed to be honored at a gala and that got canceled. Uh, I was supposed to go see family. I couldn't go see them. My father was sick. I mean, it was just, everything was terrible. I opened my, my five minute journal. And I was like, what am I going to write today? This is the worst day. And I look over and I have this like bunny rabbit doorstop and it's just like cute. Like it's just a functional and charming object. And I was like, I'm grateful for my bunny rabbit doorstop. <laughs> you know, I, I, and it made me smile. I was like, I am grateful for my husband. I'm grateful for my dog. Like at the end of the day, like there are good, there are good things that you can find to be happy about. Um, and so I think forcing yourself to remember, like, yes, it can always be worse. There are always things to be grateful for. Um, and I don't let myself harp, you know, I don't let myself ruminate on things that make me unhappy. I really try to just snap myself out of them because I found that that's just a habit I used to have is, is because I am somebody that's always thinking about the future and thinking about what's next. It's easy to ruminate on what you, where you're not, you know, but I force myself to think about where I want to be rather than where I'm not. So yeah. wow. it's, it's hard to get out of that. I mean, it's <clears throat> you're talking about two different dimensions there. You, you know, you're trying to level yourself out on both. The part that says take it easy and the part that's like, keep grinding. You got stuff to do, man. Mm -hmm. And it gets you can get caught up. Yeah. Too easily. So I, I love how you're using the five minute journal. Where'd you find that? Where'd you hear about that? It looks like, it looks like our buddy, uh, Kenny Wynn is a fan of the five minute journal. So where yeah. you that? Yeah. I think, I think Kenny actually told me about it. Honestly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not he, surprised about that answer either. Yeah. I think he, um, I think he's the one who told me about it and you know, I, I I've been doing it. I want to say for like two years now and wow, ooh, it's a great tool. Kenny tells me about all the best stuff. Um, oh, yeah. He's a good resource. Show enough is love that man. And if he's watching, mm -hmm. COVID <laughs> hug, man. I love you, brother. I miss you. Wi Fi high five. Yeah. Wi Fi high five. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so, where do you get the five minute journal? Where do you get that from? The internet. Google it. Um, hold on. What does this say? Five minute journal.com. Boom. Right there. Midnightjournal.com. <laughs> oh, Kenny, I love you, man. You, Rob? What, do you do? what do you do? What do you share with both of us? What about you? Oh, was that for me? I'm sorry. I was clicking. I didn't I didn't yeah. hear you. What'd you say? So we both shared. What about you? What do you do? To uh, show gratitude? Mm -hmm. Like to show gratitude to uh, to be able to continue oh, well, to perform. I, I fail at the self care miserably. If, if, if I'm I'm very much like Adrian in the respect that <clears throat> I might know about my surroundings and I'm a, I'm aware of them, so I'm like absorbing the feedback of what like what my actions or impact is. I get that. So I have that as like a base, but I kind of like compartmentalize it and move it over here off screen. Because the whole time I'm still thinking about what can I do? What more is left? Who do I need to talk to? What, you know, so for me, I really don't do the self-care. If there's something I need to get done, I get it done because I know of the consequences that's going to be that that is going to be, be left for me. Um, but it's it's tough. Like I there's so many like today I should have taken a break about five different times and I did. Um uh, in fact, the time that I did, I spent 20 minutes on the couch between six o'clock and six 20 taking a cat nap because mm -hmm. I needed it and I needed a, I needed to get that coffee 
a coffee burst of energy, but through a nap, like like Adrian's talking in the afternoon. So I, I, I'm horrible at the self care. Actually, the one self care I did today was take that nap. But everything else up here is saying go go go. You have stuff to get done. For instance, closed on a house today. Call. I closed on well. I closed on house. I refinanced. Sorry, we right we refinanced in front of our patio in the front patio. By the way, that's awesome. Oh wow! Really cool. <laughs> Great, great experience. I don't want to close anywhere else unless they're going to give me like, you know, melon water or something special. Um, melon water. <laughs> I don't know. I just made that up. This seems like it would be a thing. I it would be you something know, more than that. Melon water. It would have to be melon water plus like, you know, a couple thousand dollars. No, I'm saying. Anyways, the point is so much was going on today and I did not take the break. I really take the break. That's there's something there. There's something there. Kenny. Kenny Work with me on take the break, self-care. Anyways, the point is I did not take self-care seriously for myself. I typically am better at identifying it for others. So I will say, hey, Dima, you need to chill out. Hey, Adrian, you know, you've been at six gear full throttle for three days. You need to calm down, uh, you know, and I'll take care of everyone else but myself. Mm -hmm. So the, the only way I show gratitude, the way I show caring, though, is by doing for others. But I, I'm horrible at showing that for myself. Horrible. Yeah. I need yeah. others to, to help me care for me. I see that a lot. That sounded really bad, didn't it? Mm -hmm. I need others help to help me care we for me. We can help you. Reminders. It's like the check-ins. You just need a little like, hey, you, you could use a five-minute journal today. <laughs> yeah. Good call. Yeah. You need to start doing that five minutes every morning. Okay, so does it take five minutes or is it more like seven and a half? It's more like four for me. Really? But I'm an overachiever, so. <laughs> Dima, do you write anything down like this? I mean, maybe you don't have the five minute journal, but do you write anything to like put it, you know, put it down? So it I try. Hard? I have I have a journal and I try and I'm like I have all of these wonderful ideas and I'm like, oh, I have to write them down in a journal or, or you know, things that happen in my life, because as a keynote speaker, I need to capture these stories. So I would include them in my in my keynotes. But somehow I don't make time for it. So this is something that is part of my, uh, uh, I guess, goals coming up is to make half an hour at the end of the day to document everything that uh, and not just personal, also business, anything, any messages, stories, experiences that I need to capture. Um, but, but somehow I haven't been doing it. Like even jokes, jokes are so important, especially for the keynotes to find really interesting jokes. And after a while, I forget the jokes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just a matter of making time for that. Yeah. I so know it's that it. easy to say, it's hard to really stop and do it. I think and we, we need someone like journal. Adrian. Mm -hmm. We have a we journal. We need Adrian to be our uh, accountability buddy. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. I will be your accountability buddy. Glad you know what? She was structured enough to get her guild to top 40. She could remind us every day, this is now your duty, Adrian. My guild was number She'd one. Be grateful for 30 minutes. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I, you know, I think as a leader, that is one of the challenging things, though. I see it on my team right now. You know, we went through a reorg. They have so much more work fewer people to get it done. Um, you know, people are dealing with aging, ailing parents, just the anxiety of COVID, um, being remote, life just being out of whack, you know, people canceling vacations, not being able to go out to eat, just life is not normal. And I, I see it happen, you know, I see it on their faces, um, just the exhaustion, the emotional exhaustion. And I, I do think that that's, as a leader, something you have to recognize and kind of find a way to be a happy warrior and not, not like you can't be your authentic self. I think it's important to be on it. Like I'm very candid with my team. I, you know, I'm having a hard time or you know, I'm, I'm worried about my dad, but you also have to recognize when your team is struggling and try to um, lift them up and figure out how can you help and just say, you know, I see you. How can I help you? Um, I feel like that's something that leaders don't do enough. You know, just how, what can I take? How can I help? You know, 
Wow. You know, I love the fact that you said, mm -hmm. I see you. That's so powerful because right now we're just so isolated and a lot of us were behind the screen. So many people feel that they're invisible. And uh, the biggest thing for us as humans is the connection. And that's why Rob and I, we were talking and we started the chit chat, but the connection, but when the uh, leader and uh, looks at the team, team members and truly sees them, truly hears them, that is just so powerful. It's hard. Especially when you get a, bit, a bigger team, you know, it's easy to do with a smaller number of people, the bigger the team gets, you know, once scale starts to happen, um, you have to find ways to kind of force that it, when it doesn't happen as organically, especially in a remote environment, you know, it used to be, I'd, I'd walk the floor and I could see people. Yep. Um, yeah. I'd say walk with me to Starbucks down the street or, you know, whatever. Um, I'd say, let's have a walk and chat and, you know, walk with them up the stairs. And, and that doesn't happen now. So, so you do kind of have to, I'll ping people and say, I, I saw this on Twitter. I thought you'd like it, you know, just find some way to kind of connect and keep that rapport up. So tell us more about that because that is so powerful. Tell us more about, uh, so Adrian, and just, just tell us about it. Tell us some more about it. Yeah. So you told us about the Twitter. No, no, this, this is great because I love this topic. You told us about the Twitter. You told us no, about Twitter. And, Twitter. With them. and uh, so what, what else do you do? Because one of the things that is amazing about you is leadership. I heard about you and how wonderful leader you are before I ever met you. So, um, so I can only imagine how you're being very thoughtful to find these things to stay connected with your team. So tell us more. I'm going to be honest. Every day I feel like I could do better. I mean, it, oh, it makes me cringe when you say I heard you were a good leader because I just imagine somebody being like, she didn't help me today. You know, I don't know. I just, it's, it, it's infinitely hard. Um, and you know, some advice that I once got before I was in the role that I'm in. So, so now, you know, I'm in a C-suite role. I'm um, at the executive level. I manage a big team. And, and, and I, I, like, it gives you a, a perspective that's just, I wish I could imbue it on, on other people at, at the lower level. So when I was at a mid-level manager, um, my boss at that time said to me, you just never know what leadership is going to through. So don't make assumptions. And I've never understood that more deeply than, than going through COVID. It's just, you know, you've never, there's never the right decision. I mean, that's, that's the truth. You're never going to make a decision that makes everyone happy. There's, you know, to me, the perfect decision is something that, that, that advances the strategic objectives of the organization and feels like a win for everyone. And that you can actually make that happen at, at, at lower levels with smaller groups of people. Once you get into high level management, it's just, it doesn't happen. Somebody's always got the short straw. And so I guess when I hear you say that, Dima, it makes me just feel bad because I, all I think about are how the ways that I wish I could do better by my people, you know? But Adrian, <laughs> we need to teach you some self-care here. We need to teach you some self-care <laughs> here because <laughs> this is where you could use help is accepting the the amazing I guess words and kindness and and the, I guess the grace that people are bestowing upon you because you earned that you earned it because like Dima said she she heard about you way before she met you same thing I heard about you two years before I ever saw your beautiful face and got a chance to meet you <laughs> in some random conference at lobby you know at some lobby conference and you tapped me on the shoulder I didn't know the hell you were you know. <laughs> So, so no, but it's true. You you need to take this and, and you need you need to be more comfortable with owning it and being okay with wearing it because you, you know someone that day didn't say you know what she made a good decision today she's a good leader. Mm -hmm. You earn that years 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 before that by being a stable rock solid you know cornerstone in people's lives for 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 business and for personal. Mm -hmm. So you earn that. I know it's hard for you to hear that. You need to kind of like take that as a warm blanket because that's okay. where that's where it's tough to accept it. But man, it's just doesn't it feel so good? Yeah, it feels so well, good. Okay. So let, me, let me answer Dima's question. I'm gonna no. like 
try to put on the blanket, uh, like awkwardly wear the blanket. I will say, so you you guys both probably know that I love Strengths Finder, and I do think that that is a way that I've been able to both like build rapport with my team and uh, celebrate their talents. You know, really champion their success, identify with them, empathize with them on a deeper level. So I am like a big Strengths Finder fan. That is kind of part of my secret sauce when I have a team meeting and I'm like, what awkward thing can I do as a team builder? It's just <laughs> a full on tricks finder, you know, and I, I'll say to my team, okay, guys, it's going to be awkward and we're going to feel it, you know? Um, and, you know, we, we, we talk about each other's strengths. We celebrate what we love about each other. And I think that builds a positive culture. You know, I, I want the team to know I have these skills. I have this value. Um, so strengths finder. Okay. Strength finder. How and I, I, find the strength I mean, finder? Huh? <laughs> Nothing. Just ignore me. No, no, no. What were you saying? <laughs> I was saying, how did you find the strengths finder? How to find it? Yeah. Okay, Rebecca Cheney. Um, Dima knows Rebecca. Um, so she gave me. No, wait. Maybe it was Jansen. Somebody. Somebody on my team gave me the strengths finder 2.0 book and i just blew my mind after that i was hooked i read it i was like okay i'm all in it was great i did the assessment one of the things that really um surprised me about it is it it tells you strengths that you don't know are strengths um so everybody knows that like communication is like an obvious strength you know but this has um more nuanced answers so one of my strengths is ideation so I'm really good at coming up with ideas. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I did never know that was something unique to me, but it is true. Like I just, I'll, I'll, I will see, uh, the other day I saw a bag of trash on the street and I said to my husband, doesn't that look just like a sleeping polar bear? <laughs> that, that is ideation. You know, you just like see uh, things and have crazy ideas. It also translates into business ideas. You know, I'll say, you know, what would happen if we could pull in this data set? Would we be able to um, better, you know, segment? And, and someone will go, well, I don't know. Let's try to figure it out. You know, so it, it comes in both useful ways and less useful ways. But that, you know, learning that about myself um, was, was fun and insightful. Wow. Mm -hmm. I love it. So, Adrian, as we're closing, what, uh, what is one thing you want to leave us oh, with yes. and the viewers? Gosh, one thing I want to leave you all with. That's a good question. I mean, the first thing that came to mind is so dorky. Um, <laughs> the first thing that came to mind was from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and that was be excellent to each other. You know, that's how I feel. <laughs> be excellent to each other. Um, and that's how I feel. But also, you know, going back to what we were early talking about, like if you have kids, play, play games with them ask them what they're doing ask them what they're playing like get engaged if you are somebody that plays games be proud of that think about how those skills are translating into your real life um if you have people on your teams ask them what they're doing in their free time and and learn a little bit more i found out that many people on my team play video games and that's been a great way for us to connect um i have a really sensitive team member on the it team and he says i'm a healer in a dps world if you play video games, you know what that means. But, you know, that's his way of telling me he's a more sensitive than the typical, you know, IT guy. And um, it, it's given us kind of a, an interesting kind of secret lexicon. Um, so so those, those are a few things on, on the gaming front. And then on the other side, you know, I think give yourself grace in this time. It's hard. Um, give your teams grace. Check in on them. Yeah. Fine. Find people like you and Rob, give you some, infuse your day with some laughter and joy. <laughs> Two days. And, yeah. Well, uh, so I gotta ask, you, I gotta ask you, Adrian, do you, um, you know, we've all had to kind of pick up some new tools with this, with everything going super remote, mm -hmm. you know, I guess what was a, what was a hard lesson learned about leadership in the remote world? Mm. Yeah, so something in the last six months like that maybe didn't present itself before COVID. So I'm not somebody that's conflict averse. If you know me, I'm pretty direct. <laughs> but um, 
in a remote environment, it's easy to just ignore things. Like when you see it every day, it's more in your face. And it, it's just easier. I've seen it happen, not just on my team, but on other teams. It's easier to let things fester. And people misinterpret and people don't always assume positive intent, and especially under stress. And so for me, I've realized I've had to be much more proactive with my team to check in if I have any spidey sense. I mean, I used to kind of get a spidey sense and be say, uh, like at the start of COVID, I'd be like, everybody's just weird. I've learned if I get a spidey sense, I just need to address it right there. Hey, you look, you look funny. What's going on? I don't know. Is, is something off today? And, and sometimes they're like, I just didn't get enough sleep. But sometimes they're like, hey, somebody hurt my feelings. And I'm like, okay, let's talk that through, you know? Um, so, so I just, I try not to assume anything. I trust my instincts more than, than than previously i've just learned to have to just really pay attention to that because you do i think it's you miss cues in a virtual environment and it's easy to like seem like everything's fine but you know maybe it's not and so if you get any intuition that that something might be awry checking in with that person i think that's that that was a lesson i had to learn to trust that intuition that's not a cool tech thing i wish i had like a use this selfie light or something but no that, i mean that, that's kind of what i was going for though because mm -hmm. you know the technology is going to solve its own problem it's going to solve the problems that technology mm -hmm. sort of has but mm -hmm. that, that's a management thing mm -hmm. that's not a technology is not going to solve that yeah technology mm -hmm. will give us a platform to do it to check on yeah to yeah. see each other face to face it's still going to come down to management skills people skills in my opinion so and that's yeah. exactly what i was looking for that's, that's where I was going with that question. Um, yeah. So we have somebody, Danielle Mack, who nice. is going to be our guest. Yeah, Danielle is going to be our guest, I think, in two, two or three weeks. So and That's going to be awesome. We're so happy that you're watching, Danielle. <laughs> love it. Danielle's fantastic. Yeah, okay, I, love uh, it. I got one last question, though, for you, Adrian, and that is, has your – during, you know, in the last six months with all of this and, and shifting more remote, you know, you still be in the leadership position. Have, has your routine, has it had to change? Have you had to tweak your routine to make things work or maybe, you know, before it was a fit already? Um, like, you know, I'm loving my COVID routine. I, I have, you were talking about self-care. So just little things that are just tiny joys. Um so I'm able to, even though I get up at the same time, I have more time because I'm the day, some days I go into the office, those days it's less blissful, but you know, the days I'm working remote, I, I get up, I get to spend some time with my dogs. I play tug. I make myself some ginger tea. I spent, you know, I do, sometimes I'll do a face mask, you know, and just like really kind of pamper. I get to wear shorts on the bottom. That's been a revelation. I like, I, you know, if you know me, I, I'm usually like head to toe tweed. I really like business professional. Being at home, it has been a joy to like wear like house dresses and be barefoot. That's been glorious. Um, I do find it's harder to get off at night. Uh, my nights have been going longer yeah. because yeah. the computer's here, the work is never ending. Yeah. Um, but the flip side of that is I feel like I'm so much more productive. I get a lot done in the day. Um, it's just easier for me. So those are some ways it's shifted. I, I, for, you know, I could be remote for the rest of my life and be happy. I enjoy it. Would you travel or would you stay right where you're at? It's a good question. I love travel. I wouldn't travel right now. I mean, you know, I, I, if I did, I need Dima's giant like face mask thing to feel safe. She has like a, like a, Spremen still suit from Dune or something that she puts on, but um, you know, yeah. But I love traveling. It's it's a delight when when it feels safe. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good answer. So, All yeah. right, I'm done. I'm done. Thank you, Adrian. This was a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed it. We can't wait to have you again. You keep playing. Uh, the video games and and keep doing great. So we'll bring you back in a few months and learn more about your experiences and more about leadership and resilience. Thank you for That's joining us. I enjoyed talking to you guys. Have a good night. Bye. This was awesome. I was looking forward to this, friend. Bye. Stay, stay safe. Mask up. Have a great evening. See y'all next Wednesday.